Ratna, Carl, Fiona, these guys are here. Fan the Flame Ministries, like I said, born in Harawa, I believe. Any, any uh, West Coasters in the house tonight, this morning? Yeah, come on, yeah, we have a West Coaster. And uh, immigrated to Australia, and uh, but also a uh, legitimate international ministry. These guys travel the nations and see many, many people's lives changed, uh, healed, touched, come to Christ. And so I just know you're going to be blessed this morning. So I hope uh, your faith level is high today, and I'll let Carl introduce himself uh, further. But hey, come on, church. Why don't you put, take, put your hands together? Let's welcome Carl uh, to the Lord's Thanks, Carl. G'day, how are you this morning? Good. Are you happy? Yes. Are you excited? Yes. Isn't it great to be together? And uh, it's just great to have Living Waters here and Ark Tribe here with us this morning as well, and some others who have come along because God's in the house. Yeah. God's going to do some great stuff, eh? Yeah. And just uh, for those of you who haven't heard me before, haven't yeah. met me before, uh, I just share a little bit uh, of my journey. And as you heard, I was born in Hawara when I was very young, and um, and I gave my life to Jesus when I was seven. And I got baptized when I was 12. I got filled with the Holy Spirit when I was 16. That basically just set me ablaze for God. I became a youth leader in the church. I became a musician in the church. I also studied engineering. I worked for Shell BP Todd uh, Oil Services on the offshore platform and, and, and uh, onshore sites and everything up there, which was pretty neat. But uh, my life was going really good until 1988. And in 1988, I had a dream. In my dream, I stood before God at the end of my life, and I said, Hey God, here's my life. Pretty good, huh? And God looked at my life, and He said, mm, That's not bad, but this is what I had for you. And I realized that God had something in store for my life that was pretty awesome, and I didn't want to miss it. So I said, God, I want to fulfill my destiny. I want to live my life to my full potential. And as I started to pray into that, God started to stir my heart to move to Australia. I thought it was a demon to start with. I tried to cast it out, but it wasn't. It was God. So I went over to Australia and uh, spied out the land and everything, and it kind of all, all worked out that I moved there in the end of 88. And by 1990, I was in full-time ministry in a church which is now called Hope Centre Brisbane, which is pastored by Wayne Elkhorn, who's the national president of the Assembly of God oh, of Australia, or it's, it's uh, Australian Christian churches. But um, so I was seven years on staff in the church there as a youth leader and musician and all that um, as well. And it's just a, it was just a, a great time until God called me to an itinerant ministry. In fact, I'll just rewind a little because I went through ministry training 93, 94, 93 also had an operation, had half my brain removed so I could become an Australian citizen. I've been in Australia 32 years now, I still go for the All Blacks. But, uh, myself. but anyway, um, so 97, God called me to an itinerant ministry and, and now I've been to 54 nations and uh, just seen 90,000 salvations and it's just been... We're getting started. It's just cracking the ice, really, for what God's put on our heart. Wow. And we've got things coming together for next year, which is pretty exciting. And it's just going to lead to a whole new level. But uh, I want to talk to you about miracles this morning. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. How many people here in the house believe in miracles? Yeah. Ever since I was a little boy, I believed God was a God of miracles. See, when I grew up in Hawara, my mother used to be a partner with T.L. Osborne and Oral Roberts. You heard of these oh, great wow. healing evangelists, right? Yeah. So the magazines from their ministries used to be just lying around in the house. And as a kid, I'd pick up these magazines, I'd look at the pictures of these huge crowds of people in Africa and India and wherever they went. And uh, then you'd see pictures of people who come up on the platform to give testimony of their miracles. And there was the blind seeing, the deaf hearing, the cripple, the lame walking, the <coughs> lepers were cleansed, all the works, you know. Turn over the page, there'd be a picture of a big pile of braces and crutches, yeah, and things that people needed to get to the meeting, but they didn't need them when they left the meeting because they were healed by the power of God. Now, my mum also used to have this old lady come to our house who had a healing ministry. Her name was Sister Perry. And Sister Perry used to pray for the sick and pray over prayer cloths and everything in our house. And so there were miracles and testimonies of miracles going on there. So this is what was being fed into my spirit when I was a little boy. And so whenever an evangelist came to our church, I'd get quite excited. I loved it when people preached faith and prayed for the sick. And I'd, I'd always watch them praying. And if they had books and CDs and tapes or whatever back in those days, I'd, 
I'd just buy them and listen to them and read them. And there was one, one evangelist, Stuart Cremens, some of you may have heard of, came from Australia. And he had a book, How to Heal the Sick. And another one, How to Be Bold as a Lion. I bought them both, read them. And, but after reading How to Heal the Sick, I thought, all right, I'll give it a go. And uh, so I just started to pray for the sick. Yeah. It was my flatmates and friends, first of all, headaches, runny nose, sprained ankles, sprained elbows, something like that. And guess what? God healed them. And we had an evangelist come to our church. He was a leg growing evangelist, you know, and, and uh, everyone, he fixed everyone's problems by growing their legs. And, but not long after that, because I'd already been praying for the sick and stuff, one of the guys in my house, you know, his girlfriend had come over that day and I don't know what he was up to, but he came running down into my room. I was in my bedroom playing away my drum kit. And he came in and he said, Carl, Carl, Lisa's got one leg shorter than the other. Come upstairs and do your stuff. I said, it's not my stuff, it's God's stuff. But I'll come and pray. This is pretty cool. So we went upstairs. We sat her down in the chair. And sure enough, one leg shorter than the other. So I said, come on, let's all of us lay hands on her and pray. And we all laid our hands on her. And as we prayed, right in front of our eyes, we just watched her leg grow out to the same length as the other. And as you can imagine, we all got excited. It was like, let's go to the hospital, pray for some sick people. Let's go to the morgue, raise someone from the dead. You know? <laughs> it wasn't long after that, I moved to Australia. And when I got to Australia, I started to develop a reputation. And it was simply because if someone came up to me and said, hi, Carl, how are you? I'd say, well, I'm fine. How are you? Now they might say, oh, I've got a headache, I've got a sore stomach, a sore foot, whatever. I just say, would well, you want it? As far as I was concerned, if you didn't want it, all I needed to do was lay my hands on you and pray, and God would heal you. So again, I'm seeing amongst friends and associates in Australia, healings happening and God touching lives. And, and then I had opportunity to travel with some teams from the church on mission overseas. We did a, a mission through Europe. Uh, quite a number of countries. We did a mission through Asia, quite a number of countries. And back in that day, I wasn't the preacher. I was a musician and I was in the drama and I may have shared a testimony, but that was about it. But when it came altar ministry time, so many people came out for prayer that everyone in the team got involved in ministry. And as we're praying for people, these miracles are happening in front of us. And we're getting more excited about it than the people we're praying for because they're kind of like, well, they were expecting miracles because we were God's men and women of power because we'd come from overseas, you know. And sometimes it's like a big shot. It's just a little shot in another country, if you know what I mean. Because yeah. I'd come back from those trips. I'd go back to my church and there'd be someone in the church who didn't know me well, perhaps they were a little sick or something. I'd come up and say, hey, let me pray for you. God will heal you. And they're like, oh, don't worry, I'll be all right. Yeah. I'm like, no, come on, let me pray. Jesus will heal you right now. And they're like, no, oh, all right, go and pray if you want to. <laughs> Not expecting anything to happen because I was just one of the other young people in the church. But you know, Jesus had that exact same problem. Mm -hmm. The Bible says he's going all throughout the nation, preaching, healing the sick, even raising the dead. But he comes back to his home church or his hometown and the people are like, who does he think he is? It's just the carpenter's son. His brothers and sisters are here. I mean, he can't do any miracles. And the Bible said in Matthew chapter 13, verse 58, he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. You see, unbelief is the enemy of our faith. Unbelief will snatch out of your hands the miracles, the blessings, the breakthroughs that God himself has put into your hands. And I find it amazing that unbelief even stopped Jesus from performing miracles. Now, as we journey with God, this is what I discover, you know. Before you're a Christian, you may not believe in miracles. But if you come to a church that preaches the word of God and believes it, you're going to start hearing about a few miracles. You're going to see some miracles. Maybe someone prays for someone or someone prays for you. Or you even get to pray for someone and healing happens. And as we grow in our relationship with God and His church, we are also going to grow in our faith for the miraculous. Would you agree with me? Yes. But I've also discovered it only seems to take one or two unanswered prayers. Or prayers answered differently to how it was expected or maybe taking longer than we thought it would take. And it seems to take the edge of some people's faith. And I'm wondering, did God hear my prayer? Then is there something wrong with me? 
Is there something wrong with God? I mean, does, does God still heal today? Uh, you know, some people start doubting and some people then start getting skeptical and others get all pessimistic. And then you've got the people who created theology that says God does not heal today because that's their experience. And then they sit in churches calling themselves believers, but they're really unbelievers. And the problem with an unbelieving believer is they don't believe they don't believe. <laughs> they think they're believers, but they're not really. In the Bible, the book of Acts is a story. King Herod captured James, the leader of the church, put him in prison and chopped off his head. It pleased the Jews, so he went and captured Peter, another leader of the church, put Peter in prison. He had the same intention, he was going to chop his head off. So the church gathered together to pray. And the Bible says they prayed fervently for Peter's release from prison. Guess what happened? Angel appears in the prison, right? Gives Peter a nudge, his chains fall on the ground. The angel says, come on, Peter, we're out of here. And that prison door just opens up by itself. The guards are just, just like dodos. They can't see a thing. And they, they just walk straight past them, go out to the main gate of the prison. And that main prison gate opens up again. The guards, they see nothing. Peter's walking out with the angel. They start walking down the street and then whoo, the angel disappears. And Peter like comes to himself. He's like, well, this is not a dream. I'm actually out on the street. I'm out of the prison. So he quickly goes to the house where all the Christians are praying. And he knocks on the door. And a servant girl comes to answer the door. And she has a peek through the peek hole. And she sees it's Peter. And she gets so excited, she forgot to open the door, right? And she runs back into the room where the Christians are praying. She jumps into the middle of their shundabundi, right in the middle of their prayer circle, and she says, Peter's at the door! Peter's at the door! And they look at her like she's been smoking wacky backy or something. They say, what are you talking about? How can Peter be at the door? Peter's in prison. You're mad. You're crazy. What were they praying for? Yeah. Peter's released from prison. Yeah. What happened? Peter was released from prison. They didn't even believe it. It's just one thing that you think you believe. But it's another thing to believe and really expect stuff to happen mm -hmm. when you pray. Amen? Okay. So I want to give you a few keys this morning to expecting things to happen when you pray. And then we're going to pray and things are going to happen. How's that for a good deal? <laughs> Amen? Number one, don't disqualify yourself. See, the Bible talks about the devil as being the accuser of the brethren who accuses us before God day and night. And somehow the devil also gets into our head and kind of accuses us to ourselves, at least gets down on us. You know what I mean? And we start to believe these thoughts like, who do you think you are? And God's not going to use you. God's not going to listen to you. Look what you did. Look where you come from. Nah, you, you, he's not going to do. He, he's not going to answer your prayer. If anyone should think like that, I could imagine it would be the Canaanite woman in Matthew chapter fifteen. See, remember the Jews and the Canaanite people hated each other, just like Jews and Palestinians today. If they had bombs back there, they'd probably blow each other up. But, but you had Jesus having this dinner party with his disciples. And this woman turns up to the dinner party, Canaanite woman. And Jesus responded culturally, which was just to ignore her, not even listen to her. The disciples basically said, Oh, yuck, Jesus, it's a Canaanite woman. Get rid of her. And responding culturally again, Jesus said to the woman, Woman, I've come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel only. Goodbye. And she's like, But Lord, you've got to help me. My daughter's demon possessed. And Jesus said, it's not right for me to give the children's bread to the dogs. Can you appreciate that one? Here's a woman come to Jesus. Who better could you go to? And what does Jesus say to the woman? Get out of here, you dog. Not for you. But she didn't give up, did she? The Bible says she got right down on her knees in front of Jesus. She got into the face of God. She didn't give up. And she went hard after God. She said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs from under the master's table. 
And Jesus said, Whoa, well, woman, you got great faith. Yeah. And her miracle was given to her. Yeah. It does not matter what your background is. It does not matter what your culture is. It does not matter what you did or didn't do in the past. Come on. What matters if you come to God through faith in Jesus Christ, you can reach out and you can take hold of the children's bread. Amen. You can get hold of that miracle. Don't let the enemy rob you. Don't let the enemy lie to you. God is the God who loves you and has got great things in store for you. And you can reach out in faith and take hold of it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Number two, look to the contents, not the container. We've got a real bad habit of looking to containers. Now, what do I mean by containers? How many of you have done this? I have. It's been real, right? We, we might have a series of meetings, like we've got going on up the road there. And um, by the way, if you haven't been along to the meetings, I really encourage you, come tonight, but also Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It's just going to get better and better. I'm just believing that yeah. the Holy Spirit's going to break loose in this come place. Hey? Yeah. How many people would like to see a revival yeah. going yes. here? And, you know, cause, and for that to happen, we just got to all throw ourselves into that and just get behind what God's doing yeah. at the moment. And if we do, I guarantee by Wednesday night, this place will be just popping off the charts. Amen. Yeah. It'll be awesome. But uh, it, we might go to a meeting where there's a whole lot of churches gathered together, there's like an evangelist or a prophet or whatever, right? And then it comes altar ministry time. And so many people come out for altar ministry, there's too many there for the evangelist or the prophet to pray for. So the pastors of the local churches, they come in out and they start helping out praying on the altar. But you come out here for prayer. Why? Because you want that evangelist, you want that prophet mm. to lay hands on you, don't you? Yeah. And what happens? One of your pastors comes and lays his hands on you. Yeah. Your hands on you. And what do you think? Oh, oh ripped no. off, man. <laughs> <laughs> I read that guy and prayed for me, you know? Yeah. And you stay here, don't you? Even though someone's already prayed, you stay there just in case they kind of come and feel sorry for you or whatever. Feel led. Or maybe you go from meeting to meeting and you're just waiting for the person up the front to have this word of knowledge about your situation. Describing it down to the minute detail, including the colour pyjamas you wore to bed last night and what you had for breakfast, and then it's kind of like, okay, that's me, I'll come out now. But what is this all doing? This is putting our faith in a man, or it's putting our faith in a man's gift, rather than simply putting our faith in the Word of God. Yes. Imagine if Jesus came to Waihe and had a crusade. I'm talking Jesus in person, right? Jesus heals why he 2020. How many of you are going to go to that crusade? Jesus heals why he 2020. Give me a wave. Yeah, go, go, go. 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 And, and if Jesus was having altar calls, praying for the sick, how many of you would go out on that altar call? Yep. Of course you would. You'd go out to get a freckle. You know, I mean, if I, I'd, I'd go like smash my knee into the wall or stub my toe or something just so I could stop my lip out there, get Jesus lay his hands on me, you know. <laughs> But you know, Jesus did not do the miracles that he did simply through the power of being the Son of God. What do I mean by that? The Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 2, when Jesus came to the earth, he emptied himself of his divine power. Hebrews chapter 2 says it was just like his brothers or just like you and I in every way. In other words, when Jesus was a child growing up, he didn't have any more power than you or me, though he was the Son of God. He had to discover who he was. And, and it wasn't until Luke chapter 3 and Luke chapter 4 when Jesus was baptized. The Bible says the Holy Spirit came upon him. And then the Holy Spirit filled him. And the Bible says he was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. Where he fasted 40 days. He was tempted by the devil. He overcame the devil with the word of God. Note. You want to overcome the devil, the Word of God works. Amen. Amen. He overcame the devil with the Word of God. And then the Bible says he returned from the wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And then he went into the synagogue and he read from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And he made the declaration, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news, to bind up broken hearts, to set the captives free. Yeah. And everything that Jesus did, he did 
through the power of the Holy Spirit. Wow. And then Jesus said something pretty amazing in John chapter 14, verse 12. He said this. Anyone who has faith in me. Give me a wave if you have faith in Jesus. Anyone who has faith in me, the works that I do shall you do also. Wow. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? Yeah, he's good. He raised the dead. He cleansed the lepers. He did all that. But he didn't stop there either. He went on to say, and greater yeah. works yeah. shall you do because I go to the Father. Yeah. Wow, he's thrown it wide open for us. Yeah. And we've got a lot more time. He only did his ministry three years. I mean, we've got a lot more time. We can accomplish a lot more. But why did he say that at the end? Because I go to the Father. What did he do when he went to the Father? He sent the Holy Spirit. So every single one of us could receive exactly the same power source that Jesus himself had. That's why Acts 1.8 says you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outermost parts of the earth. So he fills us with the Holy Spirit, not just to give us warm fuzzies, not just to give us shundabundis, but to give us power to transform the world around us, to be his hands, to be his feet, to impact communities for his glory. Amen. So you don't need to go to some superstar to get prayer when you're sick. Just someone who's full of the Holy Spirit and has faith. And if you're full of the Holy Spirit and you have faith, pray for yourself when you're sick. Be healed in Jesus' name. Just stand in front of your bed when you do that, you know, just in case you're <laughs> whacked out. Come here. Number three. We could, could, I might put a couple of points in here. Number one is just we need to really expect a miracle, right? Mm. Every single person who Jesus prayed for in Scripture was healed. The thing is, though, not all of them were healed instantly. Most of them were healed instantly, right? Immediately, instantly, whatever it might be. There are a few that weren't like the lepers that Jesus prayed for, at least 10 lepers that he said, go show yourselves to the priests. The Bible says, as they went, they were healed. Mm. They must have gone some distance because only one of them bothered to come all the way back to Jesus and actually thank him for the miracle. So, so it's awesome. I love praying for the sick. I, I love, and I love when the instant miracles happen. And I've seen many, many instant miracles happen. And, uh, but we've got to be careful not to abort a breakthrough. In other words, having received prayer, the Bible says, these signs shall accompany those who believe. You shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So when someone lays hands on you and pray, often... There's immediate change in symptoms and circumstances. Often pain leaves. Often something happens. A leg grows or ear pops open or whatever it might be. But then there's times where it's a little bit of a, a process. The healing takes a little bit of time, whatever it might be, you know. And the problem is we, living in modern society, we, we want everything quick. Push button this, push button that, you know. Instant this. You go to some people's houses, you'll find five remote controls on their coffee table. One for the telly, one for the DVD, one for the stereo, one for the air conditioner, one for the wife. I mean, there's just there's <laughs> buttons for everything these days. Don't you wish you had one of those? <laughs> Maybe one for the husband. <laughs> but you know, we got McDonald's. Is there a McDonald's in Waihee? No, 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 no. no McDonald's. It hasn't quite made it yet. Not to the way. Way. That's good. But anyway, you've probably been to McDonald's, have you? Somewhere? Uh, a, few, a few years ago in Australia, McDonald's had this special deal. And the deal was this. If you did not get your burger in one minute, they gave it to you for free. Did they have that one in New Zealand? Yeah. It was, you know, they had a little clock on the counter. And you ordered your burger, and then you tapped the clock. You had the, the right to tap the clock. And if it wasn't there in a minute... They gave it to you for free. And if you were like me, when I was a bit younger and had more of an appetite, I'd pray that something would happen, you know, that someone would trip up in there or, you know, somehow they just wouldn't get it out in time. So I'd get two for the price of one, basically, was what I was after at the time. But, but what were they doing? 
they were teaching us to be impatient. And, and, and you know, this is just a few years after this. I remember McDonald's. I went with some mates, and they ordered a meal, and they sat down. And I ordered McFeast. You have McFeast in New Zealand? Yeah. McFeast. And I ordered a McFeast, and uh, the guy looked over the counter at me in fear and trepidation. I mean, he was like trembling almost. He was like, y y your burger will be a minute and a half? I is that all right? Like I was going to have road rage or something, because <laughs> the burger was going to be a minute and a half. And it's ridiculous, isn't it? Wow. But this is the problem in modern society. People go from McDonald's mentality to McChurch mentality. That's right. And they come to church and they expect their needs met straight away. They expect that they can just click their fingers and God will do what they want when they want it to happen. But that's not how it works. Amen. God can and often does, but God sometimes has a process and he's sometimes doing a deeper work in the whole picture as well. Amen. But I love it when I lay hands on somebody and they get an instant miracle. I was praying in Harvey Bay, right? This is in Queensland, yeah. Australia. And there was a girl in me, had a car accident. She smashed her neck. She, she had this big bulge on her neck and couldn't move her head anymore. And she had a lot of pain and all that. And so I just put my hand on this bump on the back of her neck and I prayed. And it just went, whoa. I just went, whoa. I said, whoa, did you feel that? And she goes, Yes, I felt that and I got no pain. I can move my neck. And she's yeah. doing the wax. Awesome. And I'm like, and she said, and not only that, she says, I had one leg shorter than the other. I had lower back pain. While you were praying, I could feel power going down my leg. I could feel my leg growing out and my lower back pain's gone as well. I thought, praise God, she got the worst burger. So it's like, <laughs> pretty neat. Amen. Do you know, sometimes it takes a little while. I was sharing last night about this little boy that I prayed for in my hometown, Harborough, who had multiple problems. And it wasn't until I come back a year later that I hear that he's healed of all of those things. And this often happens as an evangelist. I come back to hear the stories of people waking up the next morning healed. One, one, one person, I prayed for a blind eye, or it was at least a blurry eye with a growth in the eye. Nothing seemed to happen, but I went to dinner with the pastor, lunch, and at the lunch, the mother rings the pastor and said, she's healed. An hour later, a guy in Wellington who had growths all down the side of his body, and the next morning, he woke up and they were all gone. I didn't hear about it until six months later when I came back. So there's these kind of things. I was talking last night about pregnancies. I mean, I prayed for hundreds of couples who can't have children, and then I turn up a year later, and they come up, and they push the baby in my face, and they say, this is your fault. <laughs> all sorts of stuff like that, but sometimes it just takes a while. But we need to understand how God works. That's right. You see, Jesus was walking into Jerusalem with the disciples one day, and he came across a fig tree. And he thought, oh, I feel like a fig right now. So he goes over the fig tree, does a little, little look around, and there's no figs on the fig tree, so he curses it, you rotten fig tree. Nobody's going to eat from you again. And off he goes. Poor fig tree. It wasn't even the season for figs. <laughs> but that's another story. Anyway, off he goes. The next day, I'm walking past the fig tree. One of the disciples says to Jesus, Hey, Jesus, look at that fig tree that you cursed. It's withered from the roots up. From the roots up. This is very important to understand because a lot of our physical problems have got spiritual and or emotional roots. There's a lady in a meeting who had arthritic pain all over her body. The evangelist had a word of knowledge that she needed to forgive someone. She burst into tears, repented, forgave the person. She'd been harboring bitterness in her spirit. Arthritis left her body. Nobody even laid hands on her. There was a legal right. There was a spiritual root right there. I visited a lady in hospital who nearly died from septicemia. That's a poison infection. I said to her, you know there's a bigger picture, don't you? She said, yes, I know. I said, good, let's pray. She said, okay, and she started to pray. She said, God, I'm sorry. I hated this person. I hated that person. I hated this person. And I'm sitting there going, flipping heck. I mean, no, nice people she's talking about. I thought, no wonder she had poison in her body because she had poison in her soul. Amen. Amen. Yeah. 
And this is a real key issue. You've probably heard of psychosomatic illness and stuff like that. You know, a huge amount of sicknesses has to do with what's going on inside of somebody. Yeah. And, and the sad reality is a lot of people just let stuff boil up. Yeah. It brews up. You know, in our world, we get hurt. If you've been hurt by somebody at some stage, welcome to the human race. We all get hurt by somebody at some time. It's not a matter of whether or not you got hurt, and some of us have been hurt really bad. Some of us, it's really messed with us. But the reality is, it's not a matter of what happened. It's a matter of how we deal with that, what we do with that. And this is why Jesus, when he gave us the Lord's Prayer, he said this. We've got to pray like this. Father, forgive us of our sins as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. And if we, if we don't quite get it, he then adds on to that and says... Because if you don't forgive those who sinned against you, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you of your sins. That's pretty full on right there, isn't it? It's like because there's people sitting in churches for years holding unforgiveness or bitterness in their spirit against somebody that hurt them, wondering why God's not answering their prayers. <coughs> wondering why they're, and they're getting arthritis and they're getting cancer and they're getting all these things in their body. We've got to deal with these roots. And sometimes we think, man, this is it's hard work dealing with the roots. We don't want to forgive someone who's been a mongrel or a monster. It's just we just want them to rot in hell. We want them to be struck with lightning. But we've got to forgive for our own sake. See, the enemy's found a he's found a place in our heart. He can push a button. He can every time he push that button, it just stirs up anger and it keeps us locked up and it just festers and creates that environment for the devil to do whatever he likes in our lives. But if he pushes that button and out of your mouth goes, God, I forgive them and I bless them. It's like the devil's going to go, eh, eh, short circuit here. What the heck? This, what's wrong with this button? You know, And he's going to stop pushing that button, isn't he? And out of your life, instead of bitterness coming out of your life and out of your spirit and constantly eating you up, you're going to have nice, fresh, living, life-giving water coming out of you. Amen. And so we just let the Lord do that deep work. And you know, sometimes we really need the grace of God to help us with that. Like when Jesus was on the cross and looked at those who put him there, stripped him naked and beat him to a pulp and ripped his body to shreds and nailed him there. And he looks down and says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And that's the reality. A lot of pe people who hurt people are hurt people. Yeah. It's just what happens. Sometimes it's just patterns of behavior, and sometimes it's just because I messed up and hurting, and it's just an outward out stuff. So we forgive. It sets us up to be healed. But then, when we're praying, imagine I, I was I was. Um, sometimes you've got to pray more than once, right? Doesn't mean we don't have faith. I was in prison in New Zealand. Um, not because I was a bad boy, right? But my brother was a prison chaplain. And he invited me to come and preach. This is when I was in my early 20s. One of my early sermons before I moved to Australia. He said, come and preach to the prisoners. And I came and I went into that prison chapel. It was quite packed. And I said to the guys, does anyone here need a miracle? And a few guys put their hand up. I said, good, today you're going to get your miracle. It's quite bold, eh? And, uh, and anyway, had an altar call at the end. All these people come out for prayer. One of these guys, he ripped his shoulder out, and he was in a whole lot of pain. And so I laid my hands on him. I prayed, and I said, how's that? And he goes, ooh, he's still sore. And I turned around to my brother, and I said, oh, flip it, heck. <laughs> I said, he's still sore. And my brother said, it's all right. Remember Jesus prayed for a blind man a second time? Remember that one? He prayed for that guy. He said, how's that? And the guy's like, well, you know, I can see people, but they look like trees walking around. It's still blurry, man. And so Jesus laid his hands back on him a second time, and his sight was restored. So we laid our hands back on him a second time. Standing in front of me, he goes like this. Like, nearly punched me in the nose, turned around, ran out of the room. I thought, what a fruitcake. I just prayed for some other people. About... Ten minutes later, the guy came back into the room, puffing away. I said, where have you been? He said, I've been next door in the gym lifting weights. My shoulder's great. <laughs> I thought that was all right. Oh. 
this guy in, in England had an incurable disease in his eye, Ames Odie. Well, yeah, I think it's Ames Odie. It's like the pupil of his eye wouldn't dilate. And it was such a rare incurable disease, they actually had 100 university medical students examine his eye. And so here he is in the meeting, and, um, and I just pray for him. I say, how's that? And he's like, I think it's getting better. So I just leapt on him. I mean, I laid my hands on him again. I just prayed some more. I thought, this is awesome. God's up to something. And that's a good thing. You know, when God starts doing it, you just keep running with him. I kept on praying. And, and then next minute, he's looking at the clock, the numbers on the clock at the back of the room where the eye people said was incurable and, and uh, reading his Bible and all that. Wow. When Jesus comes along, nothing's incurable. Come on. Amen. Amen. But we just don't give up. Yeah. Just, just be encouraged and just keep on praying. And, and you know, I keep asking, I'll ask people, I'll pray for them. I'll say, how's that? And they might say, oh, I'm still sore. I'll say, well, okay, look, how, what was the pain like before? And they say, oh, it was like seven before. I said, well, what's it like now? And they say, oh, it's like five now. It's like, well, good, obviously something's happening. Let me pray again. How's it now? And it just kind of goes down and down. And sometimes you might pray three or four times until it's completely healed. Mm -hmm. But you just don't give up. Just keep believing God because God answers prayer. It's like, it's like going to a doctor. To have an operation. Imagine I've got a growth in my arm and I go to the doctor to get that thing cut out. What's the first thing the doctor's going to do? He's going to jab me with a needle, right? Anybody like getting jabbed with needles? No, we don't like it. Why? Because <laughs> pain, isn't it? And, and so he jabs me, that goes numb, he, he cuts out the greebly, stitches it up, and then when the anesthetic wears off, what do we experience? Pain, now it's strubbing, isn't it? And we think, oh, stupid doctor, you know, come to get fixed up, and all I get is pain, pain, and more pain. And in our disgust, we go out, and we sweep in the yard, and we get a bit of dust gets in there, and we get an infection. And our whole arm goes all gammy and falls off. <laughs> Maybe not. But what do you do to stop that happening? You've got to put a dressing over it, right? It's a dressing. It keeps it clean until it's completely healed. <coughs> and this is how it is. You see, when you come to God and you begin to pray the prayer of faith, it's like God goes to work, especially when we're praying His Word and, and our faith is anchored in His Word and we're praying and God goes to work in a situation. But it may get worse before it gets better. Why? Because God is actually going to work first in the root of the problem. He's bringing a few things to the surface. It might be taking a little longer than you thought it was going to take. Stuff's coming to the surface because he wants to make you whole. He doesn't just want to give you a patch-up job. He wants to get the junk out and heal your body and give you the whole lot. Amen. And so we just don't allow the enemy to come in with doubt and unbelief and sort of, well, the circumstances or the symptoms kind of haven't changed yet. It's like, that doesn't matter. It's what the Word of God says. You've got to whack a dressing over that. What's the dressing? It's the, it's your, it's the promises of God. It's, it's praising God. It's thanking God. It's affirming what His Word says in the situation until you see the situation line itself up with the Word of God. Amen? Sometimes God will take us on a journey of faith teaching us to trust Him. Imagine a, a little kid going on a journey in a car with their dad and the kid says, Dad, can I have an ice cream? Father says, yes, sure, son. There's a shop 10 k's up the road. I'll buy you an ice cream when we get there. One minute later, Dad, can I have an ice cream? Father's like, yep. I said, I'll get you one up the road. Just wait a bit. Minute later, Dad, can I have an ice cream? I said I'm going to get you an ice cream. Just wait. A minute later. Dad, I want an ice cream. It's like the father's like, what's the matter with you? And then they have a tantrum. It's like, I want an ice cream, Dad. I mean, what's that father feel like when he gets to the ice cream shop? Forget about it, right? It's like, meow down the road. You're carrying like a pork chop. You're not getting any ice cream. Imagine another child in the car. Dad. Can I have an ice cream? The father says, yes, yeah, sure, son. There's a shop 10 k's up the road. I'll buy you an ice cream when we get there. And they're like, awesome. My dad's going to buy me an ice cream down the road. Tip top. Amen. And I'm going to get a double double waffle cone. And I'm going to get 
five scoops. <laughs> I go down to Timaru, there's an ice cream shop that sells nine scoop and twelve scoop oh, ice cream. Wow. Wow. In a cone. Wow. Pretty awesome, eh? And uh, anyway, he's settling for five scoops, but chocolate dipped. Has to be chocolate dipped, right? With nuts on it. And hundreds of thousands as well. And a flake stuck in there. And then cream on the top. And a big giant strawberry. And, and it's... <laughs> He starts dribbling as he's thinking about it. He starts to sing a song about his ice cream and how awesome this ice cream is. And then he starts to sing a song about his dad. He's going to buy him this ice cream, how much he loves his dad. He can't wait for this ice cream and it's just awesome. And it's like he's got his ice cream already, eh? And he's certainly enjoying the journey, isn't he? And what's the difference between this boy and the other boy? He trusted what his father said. That's it. I mean, we just trust what God says. God says, lay hands on the sick, they'll recover. You might get it immediately. He might be doing a bit of work. But you just thank you, God, you've heard that prayer. And just keep on believing. It's through faith and patience we inherit what is promised. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Finally, put feet to your faith. <laughs> faith without works is dead, the Bible says. If you're going to make a stand in faith, sometimes you first need to take a step. Right, And uh, this is why I pray for people who are sick and then I tell them to do something. I tell them to move what couldn't move before or try out what couldn't try out before. I was talking to the guys last night out in Africa. We have the big crowd of people, so I don't get to lay my hands on everybody. I just tell them lay their hands on themselves. <coughs> and then I just shout out healings from the platform, different things. And then people will come out and start to testify. And you have all the miracles neat things happening. Amongst that one time, I had a lady in my team from Auckland who had Crohn's disease her entire life. And, and we have this area roped off in front of the platform. She'd been on medication up to six times a day. She had chronic pain when she'd eat certain foods and all that. And, and while I'm shouting out these healings, I shout out <laughs> Crohn's disease. It just kind of come out. And as it came out, I'm like, Oh, yeah, she's got Crohn's disease, you know. And I looked, she turned around and she had this big smile on her face and she got instantly and totally healed of Crohn's oh, disease. Wow. She went straight off her medication. She started eating these foods she couldn't eat normally and there was no problem with that. And she came back to New Zealand, went to her doctor. He examined her and said, I can find no trace of Crohn's disease in your body. Fantastic. That's pretty cool, eh? Hey? And, and so these kind of things happen. But it's it, there was one guy in a meeting, right? And... Um, had a broken arm, came out for prayer. The evangelist prayed for him and said, do something you couldn't do before. So this guy jumps up onto the platform, jumps up onto the pulpit, does a backward somersault down onto the altar. The evangelist, what did you do that for? Man says, I couldn't do that before. <laughs> One of my favorite Evangelist, one of my greatest inspirations was a man by the name of Smith Wigglesworth, right? Yeah. Many of you heard of him. Come. And uh, man, talk about a radical, yeah. radical man of faith, eh? Yeah. And if you had an ulcer or a cancer in your stomach, you know how he prayed for you, right? <laughs> Bam! He punched you hard. People sometimes spat ulcers and cancers out of their mouth when he prayed for them like that. Now, he wasn't being reckless. He said, I'm not hitting the person. I'm hitting the disease. Sometimes the person gets in the way, but I, I'm hitting the disease, you know. And, and the reason he prayed like that, because when he was young and he had some, some stomach issue, someone prayed for him by whacking him in the stomach, he got healed, and he thought, well, that works, you know. And so he just did it. And, but he did all sorts of crazy stuff like that. He raised 14 people from the dead during his ministry. And he didn't do that nicely either. Do you know how he'd raise somebody from the dead? He'd pick up the corpse and throw it against the wall. <laughs> Could you imagine that? Live! <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work the first time. That's all right. We'll give it another go. Live! Splat! <laughs> didn't work the second time. That's okay. Come on. In the name of Jesus. Live! And it's like... Yeah, okay, okay, I'll live. It just stop throwing me against the wall. Will you? <laughs> a man come to his meeting with no feet. This is a true story. The guy just had stumps at the bottom of his legs. He told him to take a step of faith. What he said to the guy was this. Go to a shoe shop, buy yourself a pair of shoes. So the guy went to the shoe shop. Hobbles in there. 
says to the salesman, I'd like a pair of shoes, please. The salesman looked down and went, <laughs> sorry, mate, we don't have those kind of shoes here. He said, no, I want a proper pair of shoes. The salesman's like, all right. What, is, what size do you want? <laughs> so he, he said, I'll have size eight black. The guy goes off, gets a pair of size eight black shoes. True story. Comes back, puts the first shoe on the ground. The guy took the stump of his leg and put the stump in the shoe and a foot grew into the shoe. Wow. Wow. He took the other stump, stuck it in the other shoe and a foot grew into that shoe. Oh, wow. and that's what I call putting feet to your faith. Amen. <laughs> I see, the Bible says faith without works is dead. And if you don't take that step of faith, often you will miss out on the miracle that God has got for you. Amen. Amen. If I could have a musician or two, that would be great. I want to finish with one more story. Acts chapter 3. Peter and John are walking into the temple at the hour of prayer. Sitting outside the temple is a cripple. I want you to imagine if it happened like this. Peter looks at the cripple. The cripple looks at Peter. And Peter says, hey, mate, get up and walk. And, and the cripple looks up and says, oh, yeah, right, mate. I'm going to get up and walk because you say so. Get on your bike, you bozo. You're a butthead. He's Australian. That's why he spoke like that, you know. But no, it didn't happen like that, did it? What happened? He, Peter looks at the cripple. The cripple looks at Peter. The cripple was expecting to get arms. He got legs instead, so it's a pretty good deal. But anyway, <laughs> Peter's like, silver and gold I haven't got. But what I have got, I give you. What did he have? He'd just been baptized in the Holy Spirit. He was filled with the power of God. He couldn't wait to get his hands on somebody. So he reached out to this guy in the name of Jesus, grabbing him by the right hand, pulled him up to his feet, and he said, get up and walk. And before you knew it, that cripple was standing up on his feet. And the cripple didn't look down and go, ooh, I haven't been on these feet for 40 years. I think I better have a little rest now. No, the cripple's like, whoa! I'm on my, yes, yay, I'm on my feet. And he just starts jumping and leaping and praising God. And he caused so much commotion that people came running from all over the temple, or from all over the city into the temple to see what was going on. Pretty exciting, eh? Hey? I believe for too long, too much of the body of Christ has been like the cripple. What do I mean by that? It's like the church has been sitting there half crippled, not entering into the present, into the temple, not entering into the fullness of the presence of God, not entering into the fullness of the power of God, not entering into the fullness of His promises, not entering into the fullness of His provision. It's like the church is sitting there half crippled. But these are awesome days, folks. These are days where God is pouring out His Spirit all around the world and people are rising up and churches are rising up and the Spirit of God is moving and it's like Jesus is reaching out His hand to us and He's saying to us, Come on church, get up on your feet. This is your hour. This is your moment. Rise up and be what I have called you to be. Can you say amen to that this morning? Why don't you stand up to your feet? You know, a few years ago, I was listening to a prophecy. And the prophecy was about these days in which we live. And the prophecy said, in these days, some churches are going to have so many miracles happen that the media will come to those churches to report on what's happening. Some churches are going to have so many miracles happen, people will come from overseas to those miracles to see what's happening. In fact, Smith Wigglesworth, when he prophesied about the Great South Land, which is including Australia and New Zealand. And that prophecy, he talks about hospitals being emptied out, not any disease being able to stand against the, the people of God. Worldwide thrust of signs and wonders just breaking loose. So many people getting saved that you just can't. How many people dare to believe that this could become one of those churches? Or the church that you represent today could become one of those churches. Amen. God breaking loose. Everywhere you go, miracles breaking loose. Well, why don't you do something with me? I want you to lift your hands up and we're going to pray and we're going to ask God to do it. Whatever your church is, wherever you come from today, let's pray and ask God to release that miracle power through our lives, through, through our movement or whatever it might be. So, Father, we just thank you that you are here in this house today. 
I thank you that nobody is here by mistake. We are all here by divine appointment. Father, and we just thank you that there is a shift happening. We just thank you, Lord, that is a new season. We thank you that you are pouring out your spirit. And Father, we say, here we are. Here we are. Our Christ, use us, Lord. Do it in our lives, Lord. We make ourselves available and we ask you to pour out your spirit in this house, in our house, through us, through these temples, through our bodies, through our lives. Lord, move in power in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 And I'm just believing over these next few nights also up there that God's really going to break loose. So you don't want to miss out. Amen. Come on, let's just let's just give it our best shot together up there. But I want to pray for people this morning. And uh, we're going to pray in a few different categories. And we're going to pray for miracles this morning. Come on. Amen. And I believe there's going to be miracles and healings in the house today. But we're also, I have deliberately shared with you today my own journey in the miraculous. She started when I was a little boy, you know, and I've got this, my mum showing me all these, these magazines with pictures of miracles and all that, looking at these pictures, and then, then, I'm, then I'm watching this old lady pray for the sick, and, and then I'm listening to evangelists and watching evangelists, and then I'm getting their books and reading their books and listening to their CDs, and, and I just keep on feeding more and more, and I still do, I just keep on feeding more and more that part of my, my life. But there came that time in my life where I made a choice, and that was to step out and start laying hands on people, believing, believing what the Word of God says. God started to heal. And I can tell you thousands and thousands of stories of people being healed and touched in different ways by the power of God. And I shared that with you this morning because today I want to I want to pray for those of you who want to be used by God. I want to pray, see, see. One of the things and where I go is as an evangelist, I don't just get to win souls. I don't just get to pray for the sick. What gets me excited is training up and raising up others. In fact, on, on Tuesday, 9.30, where is it? 15 Smith Street. 15 Smith Street. I'm doing a training. It's about four hours, four and a half hours of training. We've got a manual and all that. Training you on how to lay hands on the sick, cast out demons, the whole works. And, and you'll get fully equipped to beat up the devil seriously. Amen. But I, I just want to I want to pray for people today who say, I want to be used by God. I don't want to just be an ordinary go to church Christian. I want to actually be a Christian who does what Christians do, i.e. follow Jesus, do what Jesus did. Amen. I want to I want to be part of the answer, not part of the problem. I want to lay hands on the sick and see them healed. And so if that's you, in a moment, I'm gonna lay hands on your hands. Alright? I'm gonna lay hands on your hands real quickly, and then we're gonna pray for miracles after that. But before we do, there's one other area I want to pray for. Jesus said some difficult things in the Bible sometimes. You know what Jesus said one time? He said, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. In other words, he's saying, if you sin with part of your body, get rid of that part of your body. Now, I'm not telling you to do that. But Jesus went on to say this because... It's better for you to enter into heaven missing an eye or missing a hand than it is for you to go to hell with all your bits and pieces. That's pretty serious right there. What's he saying? He's saying this. The greatest miracle is not that your body is whole. The greatest miracle is that you are free from your sin. Because your sin will separate you from God. It will rob you. It will rob you of His presence. It will rob you of His blessing. It will rob you of fulfilling His plan and purpose. You'll get to the end of your life and you might scrape in by the skin of your teeth and you repent on your deathbed, but you're going to miss out on fulfilling God's yeah. plan and purpose and you may not get that opportunity anyway. It's a better idea to throw your life into the hands of God, to turn it from your sin, run from that junk and say, God, I give you myself 100%. Have your way in me because the eye of the Lord is going all over the earth looking for people whose hearts are fully committed to Him. Yeah. He wants to show himself strong to us. He wants to break loose in and through our lives yeah. in an awesome way. But you don't want to be tangled up with junk. You don't want to miss out. Life's too short to, to miss out on the real reason that you're alive. Yeah. To let sin rob you from God's plan, from God's presence, and from God's presence for eternity. So it's so important to get the sin 
issue sorted out. We can't muck around with this. It's not, it's not playing a game. It's not just kind of like one day I'll get around to it. You never know if you've got it tomorrow. And so I want to just pause right now, give you an opportunity to get right with God. And if we could all close our eyes, bow our heads just for a moment. And first of all, for those of you that haven't perhaps ever prayed and asked Jesus to forgive you of your sin and to become the Lord of your life, I want to give you opportunity to do that first. If we all just close our eyes just to respect the others in the room for a moment. God's in the house. But if today that's you, you say, man, I, I really want to put my life in the hands of God. There's more to life than just now. There's more to life than stuff and toys and playing games and all that. Life is life is serious business. It can be lived with great joy. It can be lived with great purpose. But it's when we put our life in the hands of God. When we say, Jesus, forgive me. And I give you my life. And if that's you this morning, while we all have our eyes closed and our heads bowed, and you say, I want to be forgiven of my sins, and I want to put my life in the hands of God. While we have our eyes closed, while we have our heads bowed, wherever you are in this room, if God is speaking to your heart right now, just lift your hand up high. Give me a quick wave. We're going to pray a prayer. God bless you here. Anybody else? Quickly, lift your hand up. Lift your hand up. Maybe you're having a little wrestle in, in your heart at the moment. Don't worry about what anyone else thinks. Don't let anything rob you of what God has for your life, the plan, the purpose He has for your life. If you're young or old, God bless you. Good on you, mate. That's awesome. Fantastic. Anyone else? Just slip your hand up. Say, yep, I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I want to be right with God. Maybe for you today, you once prayed a prayer. It could have been in Sunday school or something, you know. Might have been in a meeting like this. Might have been years ago. But you've got off track. You, you, you know, even there was a word today about someone got off the, got off the side of wrong, went on the wrong side of the track, you know. And that might kind of be what it is. You got tangled up with the wrong people. Maybe you got hurt or discouraged or whatever, and you're just not in that relationship with God. You're not walking with God the way you should. There's stuff there. Might be there's bitterness or unforgiveness or some hurt going on that you haven't dealt with and you haven't given it over to God and you're like, man, I, I need to get this right. I want a fresh start. I want to I want to clean up house this morning. So while we have our eyes closed, we have our heads bowed, if that's you, it's like, yeah, I want to get right with God this morning. Quickly, slip your hand up. Give me a wave wherever you are. God bless you. Anyone else? Yep, I see you over there, buddy. Anyone else? Quickly, quick wave. We're going to pray a prayer together. You say, I want to get right with God this morning, trusting that the rest of you have an absolute assurance that you're in a right place with God this morning. But we're going to pray. There's been a few of you raise your hands, so we're going to pray a prayer together. And uh, I want us all to pray this, right? Christians, we're going to support and encourage those that, that um, have raised their hands. Maybe there's someone here who felt they should have raised their hand, maybe struggled with a bit of pride or a little bit of awkwardness about putting your hand up but as we all pray this prayer together if you know you really need to pray it mean it when we pray it all with a loud voice I so said come on let's do this together right now father God thank you that you love me thank you that you have a good plan for my life thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on a cross to pay the penalty for my sin I ask you to forgive me for my sin. And I turn from my sin today. I give you my life. Live in me. Help me to live for you. Help me fulfill the plan you have for me. Thank you for cleansing me. And giving me a brand new start. I love you, Jesus. Everybody said, 